Hello, my name is Van de Keizer. I am a neuroradiologist in Ghent University Hospital in Belgium, and welcome to this video presentation on imaging and several inborn errors of metabolism, more specifically the imaging findings in Alexander disease, Canavan disease, and Van der Knaab disease. Why did I select these three leukodystrophies? as a topic for this presentation. Uh, well, there are an awful lot of inborn errors of metabolism out there, like about 2,500. These are all pretty rare diseases or very rare diseases. As a group, they are not that uncommon, but each separate disease entity is most often a rare disease, often with overlapping imaging and clinical features. So it's a pretty difficult topic to cover radiologically, but I picked out these three specific diseases because they have uh, in the clinical presentation a characteristic that should help you to narrow the differential diagnosis. And what is that? In these specific diseases, these three patients generally present with a macrocephaly and increased head circumference in the first year of life. And when you have this clinical information and you have the imaging appearances of a leukodystrophy on your MRI, that should really help you in coming to the right diagnosis as a radiologist. Of course, these diseases still look a bit alike, but in this presentation, I will show you the ways in which they differ on your MRI so you can really come to the right diagnosis. Let's start with the first case. Uh, the first patient I am going to present is a one-year-old girl who was brought to the pediatrician because of failure to thrive. In clinical examination, the patient had muscular hypotonia, especially of the neck muscles, and the first six months of life were okay, but the problem started after the first six months of life. So initially the patient developed normally, but then the patient started to regress. Uh, and the neonatal period, well, nothing unremarkable there. It's a term neonate, born with a normal birth weight, a normal length, and a normal head circumference. And the family history is positive for retinitis pigmentosa. And if there's a correlation, well, that's hard to say at this moment. Uh, in the clinical examination, we see a very small child uh, with a length at the third percentile and a weight way under the third percentile and an increased head circumference uh, located at the 97th percentile. And the patient has an axial hypotonia and a peripheral hypertonia. Now, the differential diagnosis of the pediatrician is very broad this moment. Uh, because of the macrocephaly, uh, there is some worry that the patient might have hydrocephalus or a brain tumor, but the regressive clinical presentation and the failure to, to thrive really makes the pediatrician most worried about a possible inborn error of metabolism. So the next step in the diagnostic workout is to perform a metabolic screening and to do an MRI of the brain. And that's where we come uh, looking as radiologists. And these are the T1, this is the T1 inversion recovery, and the T2 weighted images of this young patient. And what do we see immediately? Well, maybe because it's a young child, it can be a bit difficult, but if you have little experience with MRIs of very young children, please look up my presentations on this channel on a MRI of the neonatal brain. Those of you who have some experience or have seen those images will immediately notice that the signal of the white matter is completely abnormal. Keep in mind that this is a one-year-old girl in a one-year-old, we expect to see almost complete myelination, so a high signal on T1-weighted images of the white matter in the brain, and that is clearly not the case. The white matter is diffusely hypointense, so abnormal. We would also expect the white matter to be already relatively dark on T2-weighted images due to myelination, uh, but that is definitely not the case. The white matter signal is diffusely increased. Well, is it truly diffusely increased? Let's take a closer look. Let's look at the T2-weighted images. So let's first look at the anterior region, the frontal lobes. And what do we see here? A diffusely increased T2 signal in the white matter. And that shouldn't be the case in a one-year-old girl. But if we compare that to the occipital lobes, 
we see that there are also uh, signal abnormalities there, but they are less pronounced. So there's a clear gradient. The abnormalities are most pronounced frontally and are less conspicuous posteriorly in the occipital lobes. Furthermore, let's look at the cerebral cortex. While well, the cortex is normal, but we see that these white matter abnormalities really extend all the way up to the cerebral cortex, which means that the subcortical U-fibers are also involved. So let's summarize. We have diffuse white matter abnormalities involving the cerebral hemispheres completely, but with a clear gradient. The anterior regions are more involved than the posterior brain regions and there is also involvement of the subcortical U fibers. Let's now look at the deep nuclei of this patient. So let's magnify this a little bit and we see that there are diffuse patchy signal abnormalities involving the basal ganglia, the caudate nucleus and the lentiform nucleus and also to a lesser extent involving part of the thalamus on both sides. We also see that the signal in the corpus callosum is abnormal in this patient, you would expect to have a myelinated corpus callosum at this age, uh, especially posteriorly, but we see that the signal is not that of fully myelinated white matter, and we even see some signal abnormalities in the fornix over here, which also looks a bit swollen. So to summarize, there is diffuse basal ganglia involvement, especially of the striatum, the putamen and the caudate, somewhat less of the globus pallidus. There is also some some thalamic involvement and involvement of the corpus callosum and both fornishes. So uh, what do we see infratentorially? Let's also magnify this a bit. We see signal increase in the hilum, so the white matter of the dentate nucleus should normally be myelinated at this age. And we also see, if you look carefully, that the signal in the central cerebellar white matter is increased, as well as some patchy signal increase in the medulla oblongata, part of the brainstem over here. So we have dentate nucleus and cerebellar white matter involvement and even some signal abnormalities in the brainstem. Uh, let's now uh, take another look supratentorially and what do we see? We also see somewhat micronodular appearing T2 hypo-intense lesions abutting the lateral ventricles. They, uh, you can see them, uh, they are indicated by the red arrows frontally and by these uh, yellow arrows at the level of the trigones of the lateral ventricles. So that's one thing we see. Let's magnify this a bit. We have these periventricular abnormalities, but we also have another rim located a bit more in the paraventricular white matter. So it's still near the ventricles, but no longer makes contact with the ventricles. We see that both frontally, but we also see it posteriorly. So we have these periventricular T2 hypo-intense abnormalities, which lay in direct contact with the ventricles, but we also have these paraventricular uh, rims, which uh, run parallel to the ventricles but make no contact with the ventricles. So we have a periventricular and a paraventricular rim, and we can also see that on these coronal images. Here we have a part of the paraventricular and here the periventricular rim, and uh, we also see that over here frontally. So here we have the periventricular rim making contact with the lateral ventricle, and we have the paraventricular rim uh, running parallel to the uh, posterior part of the lateral ventricles. So let's now summarize our MRI findings after a systematic analysis. And that is what you need to do in these inborn errors of metabolism. It's, it is difficult, it will always be difficult, but try to work uh, methodologically, uh, look at the supratentorial white matter, look for a possible gradient, look for involvement of the subcortical U fibers, then look at the basal ganglia, uh, look at the corpus callosum, and then look at the infratentorial structures, if these are involved as well. So let's summarize. Supratentorial, we have an increased T2 signal diffusely in the white matter, but with a clear gradient. Uh, frontal lobes are more involved than occipital lobes. Subcortical white matter is involved. There is U-fiber involvement, and the abnormalities are symmetrical. Then we also have an increased T2 signal, somewhat patchy in the deep gray nuclei, and we have a T2 hypointense peri and paraventricular rim. Now, it's a rare disease. 
but if you know what it looks like, you can, as a radiologist, actually suggest a diagnosis based on these imaging findings, also keeping the clinical context of a macrocephaly in mind. What is the diagnosis in this child? Well, it is Alexander disease. And what is Alexander disease? It has nothing to do with Alexander the Great, uh, which I simply used because uh, I really uh, liked this picture. Uh, well, what is it pathologically? It's uh, not a genetic disease. That is to say, it is caused by mutations in a specific gene, uh, namely the GFAP gene, the glial fibrillary acidic protein gene, but it's mostly sporadic. So it's uh, rarely inherited from um, uh, one of the elders or both elders. It's uh, rarely a disease with uh, a familial history, so it's mostly a sporadic disease. And well, contrary to what you would expect, on a cellular level, it does not primarily involve the white matter, so it does not involve the oligodendrocytes or directly involve the myelin sheet, no. The cellular structures that are involved in this disease are the astrocytes. So it's an astrocytopathy, uh, an astrocytopathy rather. Uh, and if you would look under the microscope, so this is a microscopic, uh, microscopic specimen showing uh, diffuse white matter abnormalities, but we can also see this periventricular rim which we also saw on uh, the uh, radiological images uh, so what would we see under microscope and the astrocytes we would see so-called rosenthal fibers and these rosenthal fibers are like uh, coarse crewer like uh, intracytoplasmatic inclusions which can be found in the astrocytes and which are probably caused by an accumulation of the GFA protein. Um, now, how does that lead to uh, demyelination or white matter changes? That is a bit unclear. As we know, the astrocytes play a role uh, in supporting the oligodendrocytes and uh, the white matter, so say they, they have a function there. So it could be that the dysfunction of the astrocytes also indirectly leads to abnormalities at the level of the white matter, uh, mostly uh, loss of myelin. So it is characterized by a lack or a loss of myelin, but the oligodendrocyte and the axons are intact. So somehow or another, the disease process involving the astrocytes leads to uh, a loss or a lack of myelin. Uh, there are several theories to what that could be. Oh, and over here we see the so-called Rosenthal fibers, uh, which look pink on this staining and have a bit of a corkscrew-like aspect. So we see one, well, we see them everywhere. Everything that's pink is uh, one of those so-called Rosenthal fibers. Here's another one indicated by an arrowhead. And this is a possible theory on how a mutation in the GFAP gene and uh, resulting dysfunction of the astrocytes can lead to myelin loss. So over here we have abnormal astrocytes. The excess are uh, Rosenthal fibers. So these are these so-called uh, intracytoplasmatic uh, inclusion bodies that are found in the astrocytes of patients with this disease. And the theory is that these dysfunctional astrocytes somehow or another lead to a reduced number in the uh, a reduced number of precursor oligodendrocytes and because well we will have less oligodendrocyte as a consequence they will be normal they will look normal in the microscope but you have less of them you will also have less myelination of the brain so that's just one theory on how this pathology involving the astrocytes can lead to diffuse white matter abnormalities so clinically there are several subtypes. The most frequent type is the infantile form of Alexander disease. Uh, that uh, Those are the majority of cases. And patients will present with macrocephaly, uh, failure to thrive, and seizures. But we also have uh, later presenting patients. We have a juvenile form, so uh, presenting in late childhood or uh, as teenagers. And these patients will mainly present with brainstem symptoms and cerebellar symptoms and uh, 
upon imaging, we will mainly see abnormalities at the level of the brainstem. And we also have an adult form. And the adult form, we see something similar on imaging, mainly involvement of the brainstem, especially the middle oblongata. And patients will present with brainstem and cerebellar symptoms. So not with a macrocephaly or not with or less with seizures. Uh, what is the disease course of the natural history of the disease? Well, there are variable rates of progression. So there is quite some variability over there. But all in all, it will in the end lead to death. And there is unfortunately no treatment. So the only thing you can do is to support the patient uh, during the unfortunately progressive disease course. Now, the MRI findings we already talked about, but they are different between uh, infantile presenting patients with Alexander disease and patients presenting at a later age. And the infantile form, patients will present with a leukodystrophy, as we have seen with uh, T2 white matter changes and the supratentorial white matter, and also infratentorially with a gradient. Uh, we will have these periventricular rims that are low in signal, and these actually uh, represent bands of Rosenthal fibers. And this rim can sometimes enhance if you were to give gadolinium, but not always. In the juvenile and adult form, however, there are less leukodystrophic changes, sometimes none, and we mainly see an increased signal and atrophy of the brainstem, more specifically the middle oblongata and the upper cervical cord. And this is an example of a late presenting patient with Alexander disease uh, I took from the medical literature. And what do we see here on the sagittal T2? way the images, we see atrophy and signal increase in the medulla oblongata and also atrophy of the upper cervical cord while the pons looks normal. We also have some signal abnormalities in the hilum, the white matter of the dentate nucleus, and here we see uh, white matter changes involving the medulla oblongata and also centrally in the gray matter of the upper cervical cord. So this is what an adult onset Alexander disease looks like. What's the main differential diagnosis radiologically? Well, that will be with other inborn errors of metabolism uh, than in which patients present with a macrocephaly in the infantile form, of course. Uh, so what are leukodystrophies with megalencephaly or macrocephaly? We have Alexander disease. We already know that now. But we also have Canavan disease and we have so-called van der Knaab disease. Let's start with Canavan disease. Canavan disease um, is a disease also characterized by diffuse white matter abnormalities. We see here uh, T2 weighted images over the supratentorial brain parenchyma of a very young child. I can't remember the age, but probably performed uh, during the first months of life, these uh, images. Uh, and what do we see over here? Well, let's once again compare the frontal and the posterior regions with one another. And when we do that, we see no difference. So there's no gradient over here, which is very important uh, in making the distinction with Alexander disease in which this gradient will often be present. We also see that there is involvement of the subcortical U fibers. And to summarize, we have a diffuse uh, leukoencephalopathy, we have diffuse white matter abnormalities, but without a gradient and with subcortical U-fiber involvement. If we now look at the basal ganglia, we see something else. We also see involvement of the basal ganglia, but remember that in Alexander disease, mainly the striatum was involved, the caudate nucleus and uh, the putamen. And what do we see here? We mainly see involvement of the globus pallidus, along with extensive involvement of of the thalamus. However, the caudate nucleus and the putamen are preserved. They are not involved. And what is also not involved, do you see this um, uh, structure over here, which has signal of normal white matter. We also see myelination over here of the corpus callosum, by the way, which makes me think that this child must be about oh, at least eight months to one year of age already, because there is myelination and some volume present in the corpus callosum. Anyway, that's not important right now. The most important thing is that the white matter of the internal capsule is visible, is somewhat darker on T2, which indicates myelination. And we see the same thing in the corpus callosum. 
So to, so to summarize, we have basal ganglia involvement, or rather deep nuclei involvement, but it is limited to the globus pallidus and the thalamus, while the striatum involving or consisting of putamen and caudate nucleus is preserved. And we also have sparing of the internal capsule and the corpus callosum. So at the level of the deep nuclei, we have a pattern that is also different from what we saw in Alexander disease. Let's now look at the infratentorial structures and what do we see? Let's magnify it. There is diffuse involvement of the brainstem, very extensive, and also of the cerebellar white matter. So the infratentorial structures are also involved. And this is very specific for Canavan disease. If you were to perform an MRI spectroscopy, what would you see? You would see this. A uh, severely increased NAA peak. And Canavan disease is basically, as far as I know, the only disease you can diagnose with 100% certainty with MRI spectroscopy. So MRI spectroscopy is a difficult technique because it rarely allows a specific diagnosis. It can only shift your differential in one direction or another in the majority of patients. But in this specific entity, MRI spectroscopy is pathognomonic, is diagnostic. There is no other disease in which you will see this severely or strongly increased NAA peak. And why is this peak in, uh, increased? Well, it has to be because the level of NAA is increased in acetyl aspartate, and that is the case in this disease. Let's talk about the pathology and the genetics of Canavan disease. So this is not a sporadic disease. It's an autosomal recessive disease. So there's often, um, there can be a family history, and both parents will carry uh, the gene for the disease. Uh, on a microscopic level, you will see spongiform degeneration of the brain, especially of the white matter, as you can see on this macroscopic specimen. So what is somewhat grayish is spongy form degenerated white matter supplementatorially. And it's a rare disease, but it is relatively common uh, among the Ashkenazi Jews, which um, if you are not familiar with the term, which is basically the group of Jews that migrated to the European countries during the Middle Ages, during the Jewish uh, diaspora. So uh, basically referring to Jews with uh, European heritage, uh, historically. Um, so on a genetic level, what is causing Canavan disease? Well, there has a mutation been identified in the gene for aspartoacyclase. Uh, let's call it ASPA for short, and it plays a role in the metabolism of N-acetyl aspartic acid, or NAA for short. Uh, this gene is solely expressed in oligodendrocytes, so uh, Alexander disease was an astrocytopathy, uh, that's not the case for Canavan disease, and what does this gene do? Well, it hydrolases the conversion of N-acetyl aspartic acid into aspartate and acetate. That's all fine and dandy. How does this lead to to a white matter disease? Well, that's a bit unclear. Uh, because the gene is dysfunctional, we will get an accumulation of NAA and the oligodendrocytes and the white matter. Uh, is it this accumulation that leads to a lack or a loss of myelination or myelin? It is a bit unclear. Uh, there are theories that say that acetate is necessary or was it aspartate, I can't remember, is necessary for uh, the normal lipid and the myelin metabolism uh, in the developing brain. Whatever uh, the exact reason is, just keep in mind that it is caused by mutation in this specific gene and will lead to an accumulation of NAA, which explains the NAA peak seen on MRI spectroscopy. The natural history is not good. The majority of patients present at a very young age. It has an infantile onset in the majority of cases and a very severe clinical course characterized by lethargy and hypotonia, uh, macrocephaly, so an increased head circumference and spasticity, seizures and blindness, and will lead to death in about two to five years, unfortunately. And once again, 
there are uh, there is nothing you can do to treat this so the only thing you can do is support the patient and the diagnosis is pretty straightforward uh, and based on the detection of increased levels of NAA in urine blood and cerebrospinal fluid and it is a disease in which MRI spectroscopy can be uh, diagnostic when you see this NAA peak uh, once again the only disease in which you will see such a peak. Let's move on to the second uh, differential diagnostic uh, leukodystrophy you have to consider, which is uh, megalencephalic leukoencephalopathy with subcortical kists. I often refer to it as van der Knaal disease because that's shorter, uh, it's a mouthful, but we have to say that Professor van der Knaal personally doesn't really like the disease being called von der Knab disease because she is a great person who has done a lot of great scientific uh, research on inborn errors of metabolism and also has well we have to say it a lot of scientific integrity because the disease uh, was uh, described extensively by uh, Professor van der Knaap in 1995, but what had already been described in 1991 by an uh, Indian neurologist or pathologist, uh, I believe Professor Bingwell, but I'm not sure about the name, so don't get me on that, uh, which is also one of the reasons that uh, Professor van der Knaap doesn't like disease being referred to as the van der Knaap disease, but prefers it to be called megalencephalic leukoencephalopathy with subcortical cysts. I'm going to call it von der Knob disease just because it's easier, um, so I hope nobody minds. Um, so this is a patient with von der Knob disease, once again, clearly uh, the brain of a very young patient, uh, performed somewhere during the first year of life. Uh, we have myelination of the posterior limb of the internal capsule, also a bit of the corpus callosum, as you can see here uh, at the level of the genu, but the white matter signal supratentorially is diffusely abnormal once again, as you can see. And if we look in a bit more detail, what do we see? Well, the anterior brain is equally involved as the posterior brain, so there is no gradient. We have involvement of the subcortical U fibers, so to summarize, diffuse white matter abnormalities without a gradient and with subcortical white matter involvement. Let's look at the basal ganglia. What do we see here? Well, there is no basal ganglia involvement whatsoever. There's a normal signal in the basal ganglia and the thalamus. And if you look infratentorially, well, we can't really see uh, infratentorial involvement. Brainstem and cerebellum uh, look normal in this patient. It's probably uh, somewhat slightly increased due to lack of myelination. I'm not sure I would call it abnormal, uh, but it would have been easier if I would have provided more slices, probably. Um, and what else can we say about the disease? Well, the brain looks a bit swollen, which is also the reason the patient has a macrocephaly. And this is something you will not see in the majority of other MRIs of, of metabolism. But if you were to follow up this patient over time, you see regression of the white matter abnormalities. So um, these are follow-up MRIs performed at different points in time. Can't really say what the age of the patient was at each time point. But what is clear is that the abnormalities regress extensively. So you have regression of white matter changes in time. And we can also see that on these T1 weighted images, we see that over time, the signal of the white matter supratentorially becomes normal. And in this patient, for instance, it looks as if the brain is completely normally myelinated. So we have a regression of white matter changes in time. And what's a possible explanation? Well, that's because the pathological substrate is not direct lack or loss of myelin or myelination. Um, why am I showing you this slide? Ah, yes, I remember. Um, the, the, the name of the disease is a megalencef megalencephalic leukoencephalopathy with subcortical kisses, right? So we have all aspects of the disease in there, megalencephalopathy, uh, an increased head circumference, leukoencephalopathy, so uh, diffuse white matter abnormalities, but we haven't seen the subcortical cysts yet. These can often be seen, especially in the temporal poles, but also in the frontal parietal lobes. And why can't we see them over here? Well, we see diffuse white matter abnormalities, uh, which probably masks the subcortical 
subcortical cysts in this patient, but on the, one of the follow-up MRIs, we see that we can now see signal abnormalities. They don't look really cystic, but it's the typical location of the cysts in this disease entity. Uh, what is causing the disease? Uh, well, uh, mutations have been identified in the so-called MLC1 gene. And the MLC1 gene is a membrane protein, here it is located, which is typically found in the distal processes of astrocytes. So once again, we are dealing with an astrocyto astrocytopathy. Uh, the distal processes, which are located near the blood vessels, so in uh, the perivascular unit or near the subpile or the subependymal surface. Um, so what does this protein do exactly? It's a bit unclear, but it is believed that it plays an important role in the ion water homeostasis. So it plays a role in the water metabolism of the brain. Pathologically, it's an autosomal recessive disease in the majority of cases. So you can have mutations in MLC1 gene, uh, sometimes also in another gene, the MLC2 gene or in the glial cam gene. And as said, MLC1 is a membrane protein found in the distal processes of perivascular, subpile, and subependymal astrocytes. And the glial cam gene is a chaperone protein for the MLC1 gene. Uh, and what is the function? It plays a role in the iron water homeostasis and this is an example of a patient with uh, von der Knaab disease um, pathological um, specimen and what do we see we see a lot of water containing vacuoles in the white matter but on other slices the white matter is completely normal so we have normal white matter normal axons normal uh, uh, normal axons, a normal myelin content, uh, normal oligodendrocytes, but you have a lot of water located in the myelin sheet. And probably because we get a dysfunction in the water metabolism of the brain, you get some kind of white matter brain edema uh, pathologically, which as seen on follow-up uh, studies can regress over time. The clinical presentation is generally mild, so there's a very variable age of onset ranging from birth to patients presenting at uh, 25 years of age, uh, but the classical presentation is a patient presenting with a macrocephaly during the first year of age. The disease generally uh, is very mild and gradual, and patients can develop a mild de developmental delay, seizures, ataxia, some uh, mild spasticity. Uh, a lot of patients will become a wheel uh, wheelchair bound. Uh, in their teenage years, uh, but as said, the disease can be very variable. Other patients can have a very mild phenotype with only some mild developmental delay and uh, cognitive complaints. Or uh, uh, so, as said, variable rates of progression, a very mild gradual disease course, and. In a minority, you can have even an improving phenotype in the small group of patients who harbor a mutation in the MLCTB gene, uh, MLC2B gene, I mean. So, my mouse, let's summarize. What are the key messages of this presentation? Well, I've only talked about three inborn errors of metabolism in this presentation. Why is that? Well, I had to be selective. You have like more than 2,000 inborn errors of metabolism that can involve the brain. It's a very large group of disorders. And as a group, not that infrequent, not that rare, but on their own, each of these disorders is pretty rare, which makes them very difficult because rare diseases are always difficult. And because they often have overlapping radiological findings and overlapping clinical presentations. But why did I select these three? Because they have something in common that is quite specific, namely a macrocephaly as part of the clinical presentation. So if a patient presents with macrocephaly, a young child, first year of age, uh, and you have the imaging appearances of a leukodystrophy, think of Alexander disease, Canavan disease, or van der Knaab disease. And I've, all, I've also shown you how you can uh, differentiate them from one another. In Alexander disease, 
we will have diffuse white matter involvement, but with an anthroposterior gradient, frontal lobes more involved than occipital lobes. And that is not the case in Canavan disease, is not the case in Van der Knaam disease. You won't have that gradient. You will just have diffuse white matter involvement. Basal ganglia are involved in Alexander disease, but especially the caudate nucleus and the putamen. And in Canavan disease, you will see involvement of the globus pallidus and the thalamus, but sparing of the caudate nucleus and the putamen. So that's really helpful. And there is no basal ganglia involvement in von der Knaab disease. And then we have some additional findings like the periventricular and paraventricular rims in Alexander disease. You can have the very classical NAA peak on MRI spectroscopy and Canavan disease and the subcortical cysts, which are typically located at the temporal poles, but can also be found subcortically in the frontal and parietal lobe and van der Knaab disease. So thank you very much. If you're interested, I can only recommend these excellent handbooks on white matter diseases, uh, especially uh, a warm uh, reference to uh, the excellent handbook, very thick handbook, Magnetic Resonance Imaging of Myelination and Myelin Disorders by, by Jo van der Knaap and Jaap Falk. Uh, and also many thanks to an old resident of mine, Dr. Alexander Favril, um, who helped me a lot making this presentation when he was a resident. He is no longer a resident against all odds and against everyone's expectations. He has actually made quite a success of himself in the outer world. So thanks a lot, Alexander, for your help with the presentation. If you have any questions, comments, or feedback, you can leave a question, comment, or feedback in the comment section. And you can also email me neuroradiology.online at gmail.com. I try to reply to all my emails. I get a lot of them. And generally, I like reply once a week or once every two weeks. So uh, don't get worried if you don't get reply right away. But I really try to do it. Um, so thank you very much for watching.